Hello, Bowling fans. This is Dustin J. Markowitz coming to you taped, as always, from the gem along the Colorado River, Waffle, Nevada, bringing you another edition of your favorite bowling talk show, Bowling Evolved. Joining me, as always, is my partner in crime. He's the five-time PBA national champion, one-time major winner, and, of course, 38th on the all-time winningest money player list of the PBA, the one, the only, Eric Borkle. Eric, how are you doing tonight? Did I tell you how much I love that place? Oh, that's another story. I forgot about that. That's another show I forgot. I'm sorry. I'm doing I'm doing I'm doing great. Well, actually I'm not doing that great. I'm actually kind of I'm kind of sad and depressed. Do you wanna know why? Uh, why are you sad and depressed? Do you wanna know really why I'm sad and depressed? Yeah, I guess I really wanna know why you're sad and depressed. Because I can't believe the people at Brunswick are crazy enough to sign you. <laughs> Now, if that is it, I mean, what is this world coming to? I think, you know what? I think bowling is coming to an end as we know it. Uh, well, uh, I guess that is true. And I see you brought someone with you to pick fun of me as well. If I'm not mistaken, I believe that's the Senior Masters and Senior U.S. Open champion, Paula Vidod, over in the shadows. Paula, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Welcome, my, my brother, Big B families. <laughs> oh, my God, I can't believe it. Are you sitting down when you're saying that, or did you fall down in between? <laughs> I fell uh, down off my head. I understand, and uh, believe me, I've fallen down many times since I've heard this. But all kidding aside, uh, we would like to welcome, Paul and I would like to welcome you to the Big B family. Well, thank you very much. And yes, uh, I did sign a, a regional contract with Brunswick. I'm very thrilled to be joining the family. I want to say, first and foremost, though, that for the last four years, I've been a part of Motive. They've treated me very well. I have nothing bad to say about the company. Brett Spangler, Scott Wilbur, the entire Motive brand, fantastic. But things do change. I am looking very forward to new adventures with Brunswick. I know that they are planning on starting a big social media marketing campaign, and I'm glad that Bowling Evolve is going to be part of it. And, you know, Eric, it is kind of scary to think that just uh, a few months ago, who would have thought something like this would have happened, huh? Yeah, you know, it is amazing. It just—it's amazing what people do for money. That five dollars a month they're going to give you must really be important to you. <laughs> well, actually, it's five dollars and twenty-five cents. I can get a Big Mac and fries. Uh, <laughs> you know, you know, you can always run by Taco Bell. You never know what you can get there. But uh, no, I, I think it's—I think it's kind of cool now that we're all on the same ship, and um, I think we will do a good job uh, promoting the uh, the brand and pushing the product, not that it needs it from us, but we'll do our best to uh, make things uh, get bigger and better. Absolutely. I'm, I'm very thrilled with the opportunity. I had a chance to punch up my first ball yesterday, as a matter of fact, the melee jab, so I'll be throwing that here soon. And I look forward to a brand-new adventure. But with that being said, that's, a, that's enough of our Brunswick loving. Although, Eric, say it one time, I know you love Brunswick as much as you love Laughlin. Can I tell you how much I love that place? I love it. <laughs> it's just amazing how much I love that place. And I can't wait to go there in a couple more weeks because I just yes. love that place. Absolutely. WCO, West Coast Open, double up doubles. Eric and I do plan on walking away at the title. And, you know, my shoulders are pretty broad, Eric, so I'll do my best to carry you. You know, actually, I think I'm going to drop you. Paula, what are you doing here in a couple weeks? I, I don't know if I could trust a guy like Eric to bowl with me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm going to have to down and just watch the fireworks. Uh, I'll tell you what, I, I, plan on, I plan on taking my Geritol and my Ginkgo Biloba and all my other senior stuff that I take, and you, you better be ready. You better, you better be ready. That's all I could say. Oh, I, I'm definitely looking forward to it. But, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a great show for you tonight. We have some very interesting topics to go over, and one of which I, I wanted to bring up since Paulo is joining us tonight. Well, I know recently an article went out about the state of Barstow and Revolution's Bowl, and unfortunately it reflected a lot on what's going on in the bowling industry today. Tell us a little bit about what that article is about and how it's been affecting you, not just as a a proprietor of the bowling center, but as a bowler in general. Well, it's, uh, you know, this is the first bowling center that I have owned along with my two partners, Bonnie and Alex Hernandez. And, you know, it's always a learning curve. But for, to go into a bowling center that has been closed for two years was almost like going into a bowling center brand new. But 
they have had bad experiences. So just like anything, when you've had bad experience, it's uh, having to gain their trust again that you're going to stay open. But uh, we also had a bad summer where our revenues were reduced by almost 50%, and our electric bill went up three times. So we're looking into solar, and you know. But then again, things still cost money. I have Edison coming in, and they're going to tell me what I can do to help reduce my costs. Well, then again, that costs money. So. I'm going to ask for grants or whatever we can get to make sure that our business stays open in Barstow. Recently, there was a Taco Bell, churches, chicken, um, what else? There was two other businesses. There's another business that closed just this last week that I drove by and I go, oh, where did that go? And it's just very difficult to do business when the city is actually supporting, you know, those of you that know Barstow, Lenwood Road when you have all these corporate companies that are coming in and generating revenue. And the Main Street Barstow, which is Route 66, historic Route 66, is, is barely surviving. So I've had a lot of support from city, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, but the city itself is not supporting. And you know, just getting people into the doors is another issue. And we're actually cutting our hours down. We're actually closed two days a week because we were basically doing about $500 during those days, and it's cheaper for us to be closed than it is to be open. So we're taking advantage of the hours that we are open, making the best of it, and just trying to increase our revenue, which we are, which I'm, which has been very successful, is our 995 Unlimited Bowling. And we've getting, we're getting people driving 30, 35 miles to come take advantage of that. So it's been tough. I, you know, I had my down week, the Debbie Downer week last week, but I think it's turning around, and I got to be positive again and be determined, like like I try to be all the time. But you know, it just gets you after a while. So we'll see how it goes. Well, you know, of course, bowling involved completely supports everything you do. You are part of our family, and it is unfortunate that these stories are more and more frequent. I, I know very often I, I read up on Facebook and different bowling centers shutting down because of business and just the state of the economy. I find it odd, though, that so many people are, are willing to put the blame on something rather than coming together and trying to find something that's going to help. So instead of just pointing fingers, no one's really doing anything to, to fix the problem. Paul, do you find that you as a proprietor are looking more towards radical changes, or are you trying to find just basic things to get people through the door? I don't think it needs radical changes. I think it just needs to be grassroots. Remember when we used to have it where you had the, the free bowling parties for companies and you were making those telephone calls and getting people through the doors and actually having customer service. We've got so many people that love our customer service that says everybody is so helpful and you know getting them the best price. Like we have different options for you when you come in. You know, if you're a family of six, well, nine ninety five per person isn't necessarily the best deal. And, you know, we have a kid's deal that's uh, two games and shoes for $8. So, you know, we have people that are willing to help help you with your game. We, It's back to the basics. It's the things that I grew up with. You know, everything is global. Everything is all these mainstream things that, they think is going to be popular, loud music and all this light show and all these uh, screens across the back. That's modern day retail marketing, yes, but it's still grassroots leagues and helping and building junior programs. I've got our junior program is building all the time and now I think I, I have two days that I'm going to have junior leagues and people coming from 30 miles away to come bowl our program. So, grassroots, get junior programs back to where they should be. And because we're straying away from those things, then we can't build the six million that we lost. So um, I think it's all about the kids. I, you know, forget the lane conditions. It, that's not going to change. If those things aren't going to change, quit, quit complaining about it. And you know, you're not going to get heavier pins. All these things aren't going to change. Proprietors have to make money. But proprietors and corporate have to go back to the basics, and that's building junior programs. I would completely agree. And 
Now, Eric, you and I are in kind of a different boat when it comes to the bowling industry. Of course, when I worked in Laughlin, we resorted a lot on our open play. Of course, we have 1,100 league bowlers in Laughlin. It is somewhat of a small community, but we were still doing 15,000 games per lane per year when I was working there, mainly because of the tourism and things of that nature. Now, up in Vegas, how is your, uh, how is your bowling center kind of fought the economy and try to keep people coming to the door? Well, you know, Jerry Francamano, who runs uh, Texas Station, does the best job he can. It's a tough environment all across the board, but Vegas is a little more of a unique situation than, say, somewhere like Barstow or other towns across the country. You know, Vegas is a, is a, is a destination place where people come to have vacations and what have you, and I think a lot of times they like, they like to go to the bowling center in between the gambling and everything else. It's just some fun, fun things to do. I mean, they're not even building, as far as, I can, as far as I know, they're not building any more new bowling centers in Vegas, believe it or not. They've built so many, and they, they just did the stadium not too long ago, but that's more of a specialty events place. But actually putting in lanes for people to go bowl, their leagues and what have you, I think it's, I think it's over, at least for now, because there's just the demand's not there anymore. I mean, they were building bowling centers here left and right, but uh, they're not even doing that anymore here in Vegas. And if you're not building them in Vegas, it's hard to believe you're building them anywhere. Absolutely. I know one of the things that we see frequently is about people wondering how to grow bowling again. And I think, Paula, you really touched on something, and I know I've read about it several times, is about the growing of the youth programs. In fact, I, I just had a conversation the other day uh, with someone talking about how bowling has kind of gone to the point where everyone's trying to make it a rock and roll atmosphere, kind of as you said, the loud music. Even the PBA is kind of doing the same thing, it seems like. I really believe that what it comes down to and what it needs to boil down to is people showing these kids what it means to be a bowler, how fun it can be, and what they can do to help grow a sport that so many different kinds of people can participate in. What's the expression, uh, 8 to 80, you can still be a bowler, right? Absolutely. Hmm. We're starting them young, and... Um, you know, we just had a finished up last week with our junior have a ball league, and every single one of the juniors got brand new Brunswick T zones, and their smile on their faces was just, you know, just priceless. And now we've got bowlers for life. You know, they can't wait to come every Wednesday, and now we're going to have it Saturday. Some of those kids want to come twice a week, and the parents are going, no, 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 we can't afford it. But <laughs> you keep it affordable. You know, ours is eight dollars a week and $2 goes towards their bowling ball. And so that's the whole thing. Who was it? I think it was the uh, USTA, the Tennis Association, that said that if you don't get a tennis racket in every kid's hands, then they're not going to appreciate it and not want to go out and play. And so the bowling needs to do the same thing. Get a bowling ball in every, every kid's hands and make them appreciate it, and they'll, they'll love it for life, and they'll go more often. So we need to have that same mentality. I would completely agree. And I know one topic that we were going to discuss tonight, and we have all kind of chimed in on this, Jim Salisbury, who is the founder and executive director of the American Bowling Consortium, which you can find on Facebook, has kind of made a point in regards to bowling staffers. And one thing that I've always said, as a staffer, that I love is being able to seed equipment to the youth. And I'm sure both of you have done the same thing, give a ball to a kid and just see the smile on their face when they, they have an opportunity to throw it, if I'm not mistaken. I'm sure both of you have. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Justin, we've talked about this before. Without the kids, um, that's the future of bowling. I mean, um, you can only hope that the junior programs continue to grow and grow because – that's the only place that this game can grow from. It's not that you can't grow anything from the top. You got to grow it from the bottom. So obviously, kids and junior bowling—that's that's where you get it started. And hopefully, they'll continue to bowl and actually want to grow up and bowl in uh, sanctioned events and and become a league sanctioned bowler, and actually want to be a part of the USBC. <laughs> that's right. That's a novel concept. <laughs> well, and it could, that's right. By the time they get old enough, they could be gone. Who knows? I hope not, but you never know the way things are going. You know, when you lose over 6 million bowlers in the last 15, 20 years, I don't think that's a very good sign for the state of bowling. No, I was just going <laughs> to say, and there needs, 
there needs replacement and you know it quit finger pointing at uh, everything or everybody and just go back to grassroots that's you have to grow it all over again we're going to have this little lull which we have had because the junior program has been pushed aside and but it's coming alive again as you can see in high school and collegiate bowling how that's getting so strong and if you emphasize that to the parents and to the kids they can see how successful they can be as bowlers and it gives them something to strive for mm -hmm. I completely agree uh, as I had mentioned we we were talking about uh, Jim Salisbury and the, some of the of the things the American Bowling Consortium is trying to do is pinpoint what's wrong with bowling per se to improve the sport bring back competition etc cetera, etc cetera. and we are going to be fortunate to have Mr. Salisbury on our show next week to kind of discuss this a little bit further but one interesting comment that was made yesterday, and I am going to read this uh, exactly as it was posted by Mr. Southbury, was, <clears throat> and I quote, bowling equipment contracts are the number one obstacle for reform of the sport. These contracts are the primary way ball companies maintain the iron fist of control over the players. If a player chooses to speak out in order to improve the system, he or she <clears throat> endangers themselves from even participating in top-level play for fear of losing their contract, and with it, the economic and technical chance to perform at those levels. The players need to understand that these contracts are a multi-edged sword. There are very few players that receive income as rem uh, uh, remunerate. I can't say it. Basically, it receives income for bowling for these contracts. Yes, I was an English major at one point, too. I can't read. It's an amazing thing. Uh, <laughs> Boy, you could have fooled me, but keep going. <laughs> Young players, especially, are signing away significant portions of their careers for equipment. If we are to reform the sport, this system must be broken and the players' organization formed to carry us forward. Now, there has been, if I'm not mistaken, 193 comments on this thread. Very interesting discussions. I know, Eric, you and I have both chimed in. Paula, you have as well. And, again, I'd like to have Mr. Salisbury on next week, which we will. But, Eric, let's go to you first. I mean, I know we have talked about this, but do you think bowling equipment contracts are the number one obstacle in the sport? Well, um, no. <laughs> I mean, I, I've been, I, no, in my opinion, and I, I can't wait to hear the reasons why he feels that way. I've been fortunate enough to be with three companies in my career, uh, Columbia, uh, Storm, Forever, and now Brunswick. And at no point did they ever tell me not to open my mouth up about certain things. The only thing that they would always wanted you to do is always speak highly of as I always speak professionally because that was your job, and to always say, you know, just to say the right things and don't don't say stupid things. I mean, just be respectful. And when you're talking to fans and other people in the industry, etc., I mean, that that's all they ever asked you to do. So the fact that that they would con that they're controlling the sport or game, I don't I don't see that. And I'm really looking forward to hear what he has to say what his basis is for the belief that he has in that as being the number one reason for the, all the problems with bowling nowadays, which, God, I would put this thing way down on the list. I could think of a bunch of other things that we've talked about numerous times to the 10 people who may want to listen to it. Um, <laughs> we've, talked about it we've talked about it so many times, and I just never that never crept into my mind as being a problem because think about it. You're dealing with people who are on staff, and they're getting equipment, some of them get paid to be on staff, of course, and a lot of people just get equipment and uh, apparel, and you're representing the, comp the company. You know, you're, you're promoting their product. It's great grassroots marketing, and, it, and I don't see that actually how that hurts bowling. If you have a comment or you want to say something, I mean, you were with Motive. I was with Storm. We would do this thing. We said our comments and everything. I never got anybody from Storm to tell me not to say this, not to say that. I, that's, I just don't, I don't understand that part of it. So I really am looking forward to him explaining his, what he's talking about because I, I think I'm missing something here because I just don't see that a problem at all. It's been around forever. They've had people on ball staffs for 40, 40 years or more that I could think of way before me. They had guys on staff back in the 70s and 80s, you know, and it's like that in every other sport. So I just don't, I just don't get it. I'm, I'm, I really, I'm looking forward to the clarification that he's going to give us on this. I, I completely agree. And, you know, I can say from the amateur side, I was with Hammer for two years, Motive before, and, and Brunswick now. And 
I've never in my six years with Hammer and Motive had anyone come to me and say that I couldn't speak my mind. I've, I mean, of course, you, you want to be professional. You're always supposed to represent the company in a positive light. There's no denying that. But I think the focal point of the ball company being the, you know, bowling's downfall is, is somewhat ludicrous. I mean, if it's a matter of technology, you can't really fault the ball companies. That falls in the USBC and the, or, or in the BPAA, frankly, for not regulating the sport better, if you, if you want to look at it from that perspective. Um, but by marketing alone, I mean, giving bowlers an opportunity to throw new equipment and to showcase their equipment I think is fantastic. If a bowler you know, only relies on one person and their one opinion rather than shopping around, and, and that's his point and the negative aspect there, I, I think that falls back on the bowler, not the companies. You know? And frankly, as, as we, I said earlier, you know, I love being able to help younger bowlers by providing equipment, giving advice, and being out there. And Hammer and Motive and now Brunswick have given me that opportunity. I think it's one of the greatest honors you could possibly have is to be a representation of a ball company as an amateur professional or whatever, and I'm very proud to have this opportunity. And, Paul, I mean, from your perspective, have you ever been in a situation where you simply couldn't say something or they, frankly, told you to lie about a company or what they were doing? No, not at all, and I agree with both of you that it, there are a thousand other things in front of this to be an issue. I've always been a free agent, even when I was on tour. Um, and actually, DV8 is my first uh, company that I've been actually on staff. So, um, and I never say anything bad about another company which you don't want to bash. I mean, that's just that's just integrity that somebody shouldn't have to tell you that. I'm always supportive of all the other companies like Motive and uh, Ebby and Storm that, you know, you it's just it's just common sense, and for somebody to have to tell you that, I think then then there's something wrong with you personally. But as far as that being the number one problem, though, maybe he just said that to drum up conversation. I don't know, or if he really feels that in his heart. But we'll be uh, finding out next week, which will be very interesting. Absolutely, and I know he had mentioned the player and organization now. Eric and Paul, both of you, I mean, has obviously I was never out on tour full-time other than doing some regional spots, but was there ever talk of organizing a players' union or stuff like that when you guys were bowling? Well, I mean, back in the, God, this is, I, I want to say this is like uh, maybe late 80s, early 90s. Um, I know the late Bill Taylor was involved with a few people, Bill Straub and some other people trying to put something together out there to represent the players, uh, basically a players' union. And that just turned into a, a lawsuit that was filed against the PBA. And what happened was they wound up filing, uh, settling out of court, which at the time just cost the PBA a lot of money, which what did it do? It hurt the mass of players, uh, just to prove a point. It did create a, a couple things for the players. It gave them more uh, avenues to pursue, even though they're PBA members, they could have a, a wider range of attending tournaments. If there was a PBA event uh, within a certain distance, it gave them a, a chance to go compete in something besides the PBA event. So it did open up a couple of doors that helped. But honestly, the, the only thing when I think about something that hurts the players, I've got to be honest with you, when they created product registration many years ago, that to me was the biggest kill to the professional bowlers, uh, men or women, because it took away the chance for TV incentive money. Now, obviously, they don't have, they don't have the, the companies, they have to pay product registration now, and so they don't pay the kind of money that they used to pay when they had the, the TV shows where the players could make a fortune in TV incentives. So that's what, that to me really hurt the players' chances of making more money. And you bowl for a living. The objective is to make enough money to have a, a living. And most of the guys never really had that opportunity, especially now. Uh, it's become far few in between. Yes, there are some, but back in the day, it was better. And I think it's because guys had a chance to create more money, especially in the um, incentives. Now that is all gone, and I don't think that has anything – I could never blame the companies for that because the companies, they've got to spend money on product registration. And they still pay some incentives 
to bowlers who do well in regionals and on the national tour. So I don't see how you can blame the companies one lick, any company. I, I don't see how it's their fault in any part of this. That's why, once again, I'm, I'm looking forward to having him uh, explain why he believes this. I'm sure he thinks there's other problems with the game. I don't think that he feels that is the only problem. But for some reason, he seems to think this is the main reason. But I don't, I don't that's what has caused such a controversy on Facebook with almost 200 uh, comments because he basically poked the hornet's nest. And maybe that's what he wanted to do. Maybe that was he wanted to poke the hornet's nest because it has become a tremendous topic. And by the way, uh, one more thing, uh, about uh, maybe about 10 years ago, might have been 10 years ago, a certain PBA Hall of Fame bowler by the name of, I think his name is Brian Voss, he came out and he said the reactive resin balls and all the high-end balls are ruining the sport and game of bowling. And he went online back at the time they had the PBA uh, website where you could, um, they had their chat room on the PBA, which they don't have anymore. He basically was on there saying that's the biggest, I mean, he was, he was going up and down saying it's the ruination of bowling, all these all these reactive resin bowling balls. It's killing the game, killing the game. Well, who does, who does that attack right there? That attacks all the companies who put money into the PBA and money into bowling, but they make the reactive resin balls. Last time I checked, they, they're not playing uh, women's tennis or men's tennis with wooden rackets anymore. I think they've evolved <laughs> a little bit, just, just like in every other sport has evolved with the equipment, you know, for the most part. So... Well, why would bowling be any different? It's it's a it's a strange topic, but I remember when Brian brought this thing out, um, it was very controversial. I mean, he you know he stirred the hornet's nest. But by the way, he was still working for a, comp- a couple of ball companies throughout his. He's been with ball companies through his whole career, and they paid him. So I always thought that was kind of weird how he kind of would say that. But then again, he's still um, getting paid by these same ball companies who he's saying is destroying the game with their products. So I always thought that was a weird thing to come out and say. I don't know. I thought that was strange. <laughs> yeah. Well, back in the 90s, the women tried to start their own players association also. And uh, a, a lawyer from Northern California by the name of Pam Pal Mary was spearheading it along with, oh, I can't remember her name. I think it was... Um, I want to say Renee Richards, but it was somebody in the tennis world that was coming to the bowling world to help with this. And it started snowballing and, you know, started going against John Summer and John Falzone, and then it just kind of got ugly, and then it just kind of dissipated. So along the same lines that Eric was talking about, as far as talking bad about the the ev- how the ball companies have evolved and the the bowling business itself has not evolved. You know, they're they kind of left themselves behind and you've got bigger and greater things just like in tennis. The tennis rackets went from wood rackets at Chris Everett and then it went to um, the aluminum, you know, Jimmy Connors and John McEnroe and then now all of a sudden you have these graphite. Same thing with golf. You know, things evolved and so now on golf you make the courses harder. So same thing with bowling. You're going to either make the oil pattern harder, but then the proprietors don't want it hard for their league bowlers. So, you know, you've got this dissension between proprietors and bowlers and high average bowlers, and I think it's never ending, and I don't think it's something that will ever be solved. Um, It's just, it's a big hot mess but you have to start somewhere. And I don't think the ball companies are the number one factor. Like Eric said, there's a a list of many, many things before that comes. And what's funny is that the bowling ball companies are the only ones that are supporting bowling right now. So how can you bite the hand that feeds you? That's my opinion. Well, yeah, of course. And because they're smart enough to know if they don't, I mean, you can't, that's, that's their bread and butter. They make bowling balls. You know, I mean, I mean, other companies, you know, they have, like, for instance, Brunswick, you know, they have uh, billiards, they have their boats, they have all other aspects. I mean, certain companies, that's all they do is they make bowling balls and they make bowling products. And to, it just, it just doesn't make sense to me to blame them 
I, I, I'm not saying you should be thankful for them, but maybe I am saying we should be thankful for them because without them, then what do we have? If you take away all the people who make bowling balls, then what, what do you have? How do you play the game without the, without the bowling balls? What, are you going to throw house balls? Everyone, I guess that could be interesting, have everybody have a house ball, and that's what you have to use. So that, could, <laughs> that would be another way to play that. That would be another way to play. Just don't, just don't see how, you know, I, I just don't the, – the, because for the most part, there, there's two ways I look at this. A lot of times I don't know why companies have people on staff because the, it, and what does it really do for them besides their grassroots marketing, which that's the part I get. But on the other side, if, if, they, stop, if they stop giving people equipment or they stop taking care of the local guys, then, what, then how, does, how do you grow the game? Because a lot of people can't afford to buy bowling balls and they can't push the game. A lot of people may, may stop bowling even more because, you know, when you're on staff, you're fortunate enough to get equipment, which keeps you involved in the game, and maybe it helps you teach, and maybe it helps you push people to other products, and it keeps everything rolling. If you take that away, how is that going to be good? So I, I think the ball companies are important, and I think it's just uh, they're, they're just part of the food chain. They're, they're part of what keeps everything going. I, I think it's I, – I just think there's so many other issues. I just think that's – that's such a no big deal, but obviously almost 200 people have comments on this, and they're, they're very spirited in their conversation, and that's why next week we hope to have Mr. Uh, uh, James on there, along with um, we're going to try to have your old boss, Mr. Scott Wilbur, on there, and I think it would make for some great debate to have somebody like Scott come on as an owner of a company and, and the reasons why he has players or he hires players and he pays people to represent him. And then we'll have James uh, speak his piece, and hopefully they will have a very friendly debate that we can uh, moderate and maybe uh, add a few words to it. And hopefully it won't be a bloodbath. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I'd love to see Scott come on. I mean, no, no promises there. I know Jim for sure will be here, but we'll see if uh, Scott is willing to come on or able to come on. Uh, and, no, of course. I, I and again, I, I have a lot of respect for Jim. I, I know he's been on a few other shows. He was on the Phantom and a couple other shows. I've read some of the stuff that he's written, and he does make some very valid points about certain things. But this was a topic that just, yeah, it was, it was way out of left field. But yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens for sure. <clears throat> All right, Joe, we're closing in on the end of the show here. We have a couple last little tidbits. Number one, congratulations goes out to Chris Barnes. How's that for? debuting with Global 900, guys. <laughs> wow, that was a fantastic well, show. Yeah, I heard the show was great, and it, it, like I said, once again, it's nice to know that uh, there are four or five people in this world who can make a living throwing a bowling ball. It's very company. <laughs> <laughs> of course, for those of you who don't know, Chris Barnes did win the Japan Cup and shot 300, made 40, whatever, 43,000 for the 300, 43,000 for winning tournament, and of course, the on the winning team as well, and that is just fantastic. He really seems to be adapting well to the new equipment. I know on Facebook yesterday there was quite a few people, including Wes Malak, commenting on how dangerous. And I have to, and I have to say that was probably the best I've seen him throw the ball, frankly, in, in a long, long time. Well, yes, I was. I, I actually saw him at the team trials, and both him and Linda had just switched over. And, of course, adjusting and getting the balls drilled and getting used to them, you know, they, they weren't, weren't quite exactly there. But I think with Chris bowling at team trials and then going over to Japan, he was just right on top of it and had the right ball in his hands and had the right equipment, and boom, there you go. It was, it was wonderful to watch on extra frame. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it, 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 the way I look at it, it's pretty simple. When you give... You basically give a couple Maseratis an oil change, they're still going to be Maseratis. It's not like they're a bunch yep. of, it's not like they're a, it's not like it's a VW going down the street with one with four, three wheels. You're giving <laughs> high class, you're giving high class bowlers, one, one of the best bowlers, probably going to be one of the best bowlers of all time, some state of the art equipment, and it, it doesn't surprise me that he's not going to bowl well. I mean, it, it just doesn't surprise me. You know, it's always that fresh beginning. And I think he'll, I think he'll do very well. And 
you know, he's he's good friends with Dell, and uh, he, you know, when you believe in your ball rep and they're there to basically help you and guide you and you know give you the right information, and then you just give the give the Maserati, give him a little tune up, and he's off and running. Um, his skills aren't going to diminish, and it's only going to be better. We all know they have a, they have an excellent product. Like almost all the companies have excellent products. Just certain companies maybe match up to different people in a different way. But I just think it's a whole mental thing with him. I think it's a fresh slate. He's clean. Um, I'm sure the money that they're going to pay him to be representing the company, I'm sure that helps as well. And uh, everything clicked, and he, he made a ton of money. Like I said, it's nice to know there are a few people who can actually make a living throwing a bowling ball. Nowhere near as much as it should be, but at least there are some. Absolutely. Also, we got a couple of tournaments coming up on our end of things. Of course, as we mentioned earlier in the show, Eric and I will be participating in the WCO West Coast Open Double Up Doubles Tournament. That is Super Bowl Saturday. That is available on bowlwco.com. You can check out. That's John Baker's tournament. John, a friend of the show's. Very interesting ideas. We always support anything that comes up, and I know Eric and I are definitely looking forward to doing our best out there. And, of course, the WBA, we've got another double tournament. And uh, Now, Paul, you didn't tell Eric and Darius that there is another tournament coming up, right? They don't know about this, right? <laughs> no, I told them it's the week after, so they won't be there uh, when we're bowling. <laughs> yeah, you know, a little bird told me that there's going to be another doubles tournament. And, boy, I, I, I just I enjoy the – especially mixed doubles. Um, that's the reason why I'm bowling with Dustin in that tournament because it is a mixed doubles tournament. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I got off on that. That's incorrect. That's, well, well, well Eric, Eric I'm you, sorry. Do have, I'm you do have the legs for it. I mean, I, you know, I'll get your short skirt. You look fantastic. <laughs> hey, you know what? I can put that skirt on. I'll be good. Don't worry about it. Um, let's see. Uh, I always enjoy the mixed doubles, and uh, obviously uh, um, uh, I've got a great partner. And uh, we enjoy the competition, and we are definitely looking forward. Uh, I've never had a chance to bowl in Paula's place, and uh, really I'm looking forward to it. I haven't bowled on wood lanes in a long time, and uh, it's always a little bit different, kind of old-school stuff, which is kind of nice because, yeah, I, I'm a little older, and I can appreciate these things. Um, yeah, we should so, break out our uh, caramel white dots of uh, old-school days and bowling on wood. Those That used to be my number one ball. See? Well, you know, speaking of that, uh, how, how, is, how are we doing with urethane? Do, do we have any urethane to throw, or are we out of luck? <laughs> um, oh, LT48. Okay. Oh, is that your I'm not, I'm not, Yeah, I'm, well, not, not, the, not the current one in the line. That's made out of resin, but I'm going to have to talk to my, my, my friend Nick, Nick at uh, Brunswick and see if he can help me out with a urethane ball, because I always... I always tell people when you go to tournaments, you should have at least one urethane ball just to change the shape of the lane. And uh, yeah. I did have that before, but I, I have not. I don't have that right now, so I'm going to have to ask, have to ask Nick see if he can help me out with that. So if you're, when, I'm sure Nick will be listening to this, like most people will be. And Nick, uh, yeah, you'll be getting a, a call. We'll have to figure out a, a urethane ball because you never know when it comes in handy. <laughs> I was just going to say, Nick definitely is. He, he's fan number 10 now, Eric. He's number 10. <laughs> God, we got Woo-hoo. 10. That's, that's not bad. That's okay. But, no, hey, you know, um, again, we're looking forward to it. Um, have you come up with a game plan for the condition this year, or what are you, you going to roll with, so to speak? Well, we have to bowl nine straight games, which is uh, pretty brutal on wood. So, uh, like last year, we put a little extra volume. And I think we might go with a little more volume on the outside, so you'll probably see about four different transitions this year. Okay, because I know, speaking of last year, I know, uh, uh, I think last year the scores on one squad were a little higher than the scores on the other, if I remember reading correctly. Is that true? Uh, Yes, but the one squad was probably a little stronger than the other, but like always, a squad is always the squad to bowl, and most people know that. And if they don't, then I don't know where they've been. But uh, yes, a squad was actually stronger than B squad. So, how many kids and, do you think you're going to have this year? Uh, that's a good question. You know, as scratch bowlers, they always wait to send the entry in last minute. But I am giving away a free room at the Holiday Inn Express um, to one winner if they get their entry in by the 31st 
And so you'll be put in a little pot, and I'll draw a name if they enter by the 31st, because as you know, scratch bowlers will wait till the last day to enter. I guess it they would will. be important too, Paula, uh, just to let us know what what is the date on the tournament and where can they sign up? It is February 14th and 15th, and you can go to wbabowling.com. We have an entry online. You can also pay by credit card, and we're going to have a free practice session on Friday from 5 to 7, and then on Saturday after qualifying. We might have a little Valentine's dinner, but we are going to have light entertainment from a world-class saxophonist. His name is Joe Cruz. So we're going to have uh, lots of fun. Uh, it's uh, it's a fun weekend. Sounds fantastic. Now, everyone, go check that out, and I think you're going to have one heck of a tournament. Of course, support bowling, go bowl. Come on, people. You know you want to. <laughs> hey, hey, speaking of that, Dustin, Dustin, why don't you bowl? Yeah. I would like to. I would like to. I am going to be working that weekend. Oh. <laughs> uh, what? Huh? That's a four-letter word. <laughs> You said working that weekend? Yeah, even I do work on occasion. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. Because I'm sure, I'm sure we can find you a partner because I think, I think you should be there to represent. Well, right. normally I would, but, Eric, again, you're already bowling with someone, you know, and I, I've only got one skirt. <laughs> I understand that. But I can uh, – well, we'll – We'll try to. We're going to try to find a way to get you there because I. I think you need. I think you should come bowl. I think you should come bowl. Okay, right, Dustin. Well, that visual will be in my head. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, check out bowlingevolved.com's exclusive photos of Eric Forkel in a plaid miniskirt. <laughs> <laughs> a sport. That's. That's. You know what? You know what? I, I think we I think you finally crossed over to that other side now. It's time to take off. <laughs> <laughs> on that beautiful visual note. You, on that beautiful you visual. Finally, you've finally taken this reputable podcast to the end. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think on that note we're gonna take it to the end of the show. I wanna thank Paula for coming on. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Oh, thank you for having me on. Yeah. And yeah, again, thanks don't for forget. for joining us. As usual, next week should be very exciting. Mm -hmm. Yes, can't wait. As always, don't forget to check us out online at bowlingevolved.com for all the latest updates. That goes directly to our Facebook page. If you have questions, comments, ideas, if you want the secret password to see Eric in a short skirt, give us an email at bowlingevolved at gmail.com. Well, ladies and gentlemen, for Eric Horkel, Ivan Dustin J. Markowitz, have a great night. Good night. Night. <laughs> well, that was fun. Thank I'm you. I'm so getting you a short skirt. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's long in so many different ways. That's really long. <laughs>